Amen. Thank you very much. Jerry Wayne, pull the lights up back there if you would, buddy, right behind you. Good morning, everybody. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. Man, what a good-looking crowd. Good to see you this morning. I'm so glad to have you on our second Sunday of the summer, and we want to welcome you and thank you for being here. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Joshua, to the book of Joshua, chapter number 21, to the book of Joshua, chapter number 21. We're making our way out of the last chapters of the book of Joshua. We have been in working through this, and we've been going, this is our 16th week uh, to be preaching out of the book of Joshua, and we're coming to the very core, the very end uh, of this wonderful book that's taught us some amazing things about the Lord and His children. And so today as we come, uh, in chapter 21, we're going to find uh, the setting aside of 48 different cities for the tribes of Levi and the Levites to have a place to live. They're the one tribe that did not get a portion of the land. And so what God done, he placed the 48 cities strategically out across the uh, nation of Israel, no more than 10 miles from a major area so that people could get to when they needed help. Sometimes, folks, I'm glad to know that my Lord is really close when I need our help. Amen? When he, I need his help all the time, and I'm very glad to know that he's very close. That was the, what the, the, the design for these 48 different cities all across the nation of Israel were for. They were strategically placed there for a reason. And, but the children of, of Levi was the, uh, one of the tribes. He was the priestly tribe, and their tribe did not get a portion of land, but they got the 48 cities in what's called the, uh, the suburbs, as Scripture says in, in the King James Version, which, which is the common land. Land. What they used that for was for their herds. Uh, being a part of the Levitical tribe, the Levitical tribe was able to have the uh, cows and the sheep and the, uh, all those different animals that was necessary for some of the sacrifices. They was able to raise their family, be able to take care of their family on those places and in those places. That's the reason for that. Chapter 21, verse 1, if you got it, say, I got it. All right. Well, the Bible begins to say we're coming to the meeting of the minds here in chapter 21. The Bible says, Then came near the heads of the fathers of the Levites unto Eleazar the priest. Now, Eleazar the priest was Aaron's son. And Aaron's son was the first uh, uh, chief priest or the uh, head priest of the nation of Israel. And he's the son to Eleazar the priest and to Joshua the son of Nun and to the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spake unto them all at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in with the suburbs thereof for our cattle. And the children of Israel gave to the Levites out of their inheritance at the commandment of the Lord these cities and their suburbs or common land. The heads begin to meet. They begin to share. They met at Shiloh. That's where the temple was at. And where the temple was at is where the children of Israel would come to worship one time a year on the Day of Atonement. They would come to be there. The temple was there. They served. The Levites would serve there day and night. They would minister there in the temple. And we find that the tribal leaders, when they would come, they came. They were looking for their part of the inheritance. And so as they came, God began to give them out the 48 different cities. Each one of the tribes of Israel gave uh, earnestly and let them, them have these cities to inhabit, to live in, to dwell in so that they could take care of their families. Folks, God's always in the business of taking care of folks, is he not? Amen. I'm so glad that he does. I'm glad he's taking care of us. You see, the division of the land is now completed. We find that God has made provision for each tribe and through the, the cities that he's now given to them. The Levites were not numbered among the other tribes of the people of Israel. They did not inherit a specific piece of land, but God had chosen them, dedicated them to him, set apart for special service in connection with the sanctuary, with the teaching of the word of God, and with the ministry among the people of God. As long as the people of God were obedient and faithful to God, the people of Le the Levite tribe was being taken well care of. As long as the people of the other uh, tribes were doing their job, the other men of God were being taken care of. Folks, that's the same thing it is today. If we're doing the right thing, God will always take care of his people. He'll take care of his people. So be mindful of that. Be, be thinking of those things. And I, I, I'm very grateful today for the blessings of what God has said and what he's told us is as long as he does. The people were divided into three different classes in those Old Testament, just like we are today in the New Testament. First of all, there was priests, 
the Levites and the warriors. The priests were the worshipers and one that howled and brought to uh, the approval of God to the people of God. The Levites were the ministers of the word of God, seeing him in various different ways, ministering throughout the temple and throughout the ministry of the people. And then the warriors fought to take the land and possess it. That was part of their job as they ministered to them was going forth. Now, the two and a half tribes that were on the east side of the Jordan River, those two and a half tribes were let, they, they, their warriors went with the other group and went in to possess the land. Do y'all remember that? Shake your head like yes, amen. All right, good. All four of you remember that, all right? They did five of them was in the first service, all right? So y'all are okay. But, but the scripture goes on to tell us of these things. But today, we still have prophet priests, king, we still have Levites, there's all three, priests, Levites, and, and warriors. All are combined in each of us as believers. Everyone has been set aside to be a priest. You don't have to come to me this morning and say, Brother Kim, I've done this, this, and this, so that I can go on your behalf and pray for you and absolve your sins. I can't do that. All you have to do is go boldly before the throne of grace, ask God yourself, and come as a priest before him and say, Lord, I've sorry I've sinned I need you come on say amen you're a priesthood of believers that's what the Bible teaches about us today in the New Testament that we are a priesthood of believers I'm just the pastor I'm part of the Levitical tribe I, I'm the the one who does the ministering and helps you minister in the community the 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 ever the Levites were the ones that should if you will serve the Lord with gladness the one who redeemed us from our sins and my job is part of that Levitical tribe to share in that my part is as uh, encouraging you and that everyone is a warrior responsible, if you will, for earnestly contending for the faith as found in the book of jo Jude. Jude says that you as a believer are to earnestly contend for the faith. Know what the Word of God says. Say amen. You need to know that. It's very important. So the different, the 48 different cities were given to the Levites after the Lord had given Israel all the land. And they preferred or preserved it and dwelt in it. God had fulfilled his word to them. And so we find everything had been done to the very letter that God had promised. Now flip over to the last part of that chapter in verse number 43. In the verse 43, God begins to share with us. And he wraps up chapter uh, 21 as he brings all those different cities and speaks to us about all those different cities. But in verse 43 of chapter 21, the Bible says this, The Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he swore to give to their fathers, and they possessed it, and they dwelt therein. Everything that God promised, God fulfilled. Say amen. He still does that. Everything God promises, he's going to take care of. He will complete what he's promised us he would complete. He will do what he said he would do. Verse 44. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he swore unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all of their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into his hand. Remember, we've talked about over and over and over how that the Lord fought their battles for them. The Lord was ahead of them. The Lord was leading them. The Lord was guiding them. The Lord was directing them. He fought them. And now he says it's time to rest. It's time to enjoy the rest. Verse 45 said, They failed, uh, there failed not all of any good thing which the Lord had spoken of at the house of Israel. All came to pass. Let's say that. All came to pass. Everything God promised came to pass everything that he said came to pass now again these folks were headed home it was time to rest the battle was over there was no more battles to be fought if they wanted more land then they had the choice to go and take it if they wanted what something else they said they wasn't big enough then God said Joshua told him said then go get it it's yours it's all out there remember I said when we began God gave them 330,000 square miles and they only took a portion of that one tenth of that they actually possessed Today, I want you to understand, God wants to give you, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, all spiritual blessings. He wants you to have everything that you deserve. He wants you to take everything. So this morning as we look at verse chapter 22, verse number 1, the Bible tells us we're going to have a call to commitment. I want you to see this as a transition in verse 22, chapter, chapter 22, verse 1 says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, 
and the half tribe of Manasseh. Now that's the three tribes or two and a half tribes that actually stayed on the east side and their warriors went to the west side and fulfilled their commitment to go and help do the battle. Okay, are you with me? Say amen. amen. Verse 2, And he said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of your Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. So they did everything that Moses said to do before he led them for 40 years, and then the last 8 to 10 years, as Joshua has led them. You've done everything that's been asked of you. Verse 3, you have not left your brethren these many days unto the land, he said, uh, uh, unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. He said, you've done well. God, if you will, Joshua was commending them. He was patting them on the back. He said, man, you guys have done a great job. I want you to know I appreciate the good work you've done. You've kept your word. You've done everything that I've asked you to do. I just want you to know that he commended them and told them what a great job they've done. Folks, every once in a while, we all need a pat on the back. Say amen. Everybody needs a good pat on it to tell you you're doing a good job. Hang in there. Keep doing that. And so keep remembering that the Lord wants to do the good things. He wants us to do the right thing. And he gives this word of commendation to them. And he says there in verse 4, but he says, but. There's always seems to be a but, don't they? But. It's a conjunction that changed the whole sentence process and the whole thought process. He says, but take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law. He said, this is what you need to do. You need to make sure you follow the Word of God and you follow what the Word of God says and the law of God. He says, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you. Remember, Moses got the Ten Commandments. He got come down from the mountain. Here's the law. You need to abide by the law. The law taught us that we were sinful. The law showed us that we couldn't live by it and abide by it because we, were, we needed someone. That's why there was atonement. That's why there was sacrifice. That's why the sacrificial system was put into place. And that's why God used Moses to integrate that and brought them together. There was a great sacrifice, sacrificial system. Then he said this, Moses, to the servant of the Lord, charged you. Number one, to love the Lord your God. Let's say that together, church. To love the Lord your God. One of the greatest things you could do in this world is to love God with everything that you are. To love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep the commandment and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You see, what the Lord's looking for is a commitment. He's looking for a total commitment from you. He's looking for 100%, give me everything you've got, and I promise you, I'll take care of you. Folks, he did that as he, as he walked through the children of Israel for 40 years. He walked with them, talked with them, took care of them, guided them by day, uh, guided them by night, took care of them for 40 years. Their shoes didn't wear out, wearing the same pair of shoes for 40 years, wearing the same cover of clothes for 40 years. Nothing wore out. He took care of them. He told them to go into the land when they stepped into the Jordan River, the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the Jordan River. They walked across on dry land. They went in, and after country after country, person after person, uh, family after family, tribe after tribe, fell because God was fighting the battles for them. He's now saying, remember what I've taught you and never forget it. Come on, say amen. Same thing here with us today. Man, we need to remember what God's taught us. Jesus was asked one time, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what he's asked us to do. That's what God promised. That's what he wants, he desires of you to do. It's to love me with everything you are. It's to serve me with everything you've got. It's to give me all the things that's mine, and I'll take care of you. I'll bless you. I'll watch over you. Verse number five, or verse number seven, I'm sorry. Now, as the one and a half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan. But to the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And, then there, and, and, and Joshua sent them away into their tents, and he blessed them. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches into your tents, and with very much cattle, and with all the silver and gold and brass and iron, with very much raiment, divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh to the country of Gilead to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Now what that basically is saying, he said he told that two and a half tribes, he said, you can go home. 
you can go home. There ain't any place like home, isn't that right? I mean, well, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. And over the years, guys, I've watched several of our good men and women go home. You know, they, we long to live here. We strive to do everything we can do in this old world. But folks, this old world is not our home. We're just passing through. Isn't that right? Amen. This is just partial. This is just where we're going to stay for a little while. This, we're just kind of hanging out here for a little while. But God, our real home, our real home is in glory. If you're a child of God, your home's in glory. Come on, say amen. And when the Lord got your mansion done, he'll call you home and you'll go home. It'll be sad for us, but it'll be great for you. Amen? If you're a child of the king, it's a wonderful thing. And I think about that. When, when finally at the end of the day, when he gathered those tribes together, Joshua looked at them and he just said, Guys, y'all have done a wonderful job. I'm so proud of you. I'm thankful for what God's done. You've been obedient to me. You've done everything that I've asked of you. You've done everything that Moses asked of you. You've done everything the Lord God asked of you. I'm so grateful for that. Now, you can go home. I want you to go home. Man, that must have been a relief, baby. Oh, man, I can go home. I remember uh, one, my first summer uh, in college, uh, we was, I was a youth pastor at Southside Baptist Church in Batesville. And I remember I, I, my, 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 my weekends was Monday and Tuesday. And that was when Lana and I were dating. And we were just, uh, uh, just uh, you know, we was in love really good then. Can I have an amen? I still love her better today than I did, I promise. But the thing about it is, is that, that you know, I couldn't wait to get home. I ever, ever Sunday night after church, I thought Brother Billy preached the longest sermon he ever preached on Sunday night. As soon as he said amen, I shook everybody's hand. I said, I'll see y'all because I'm headed home. I'm going to Marmaduke. And I made my way to Marmaduke, and I couldn't wait to get here. And, I, folks, I've been here my whole life. I know what Marmaduke is. You know, used to, we used to circle town and enjoy each other's company. Folks, ain't nobody circles town anymore. It's pitiful. These teenagers don't know what fun is. Can I have an amen? You know, I mean, bless God, we used to circle town and sit on the parking lot and, and shoot bottle rockets. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. And have a great time in, in, in the community. We love being here. But I rem that's what I have my fond memory of home. And I love to be at home. But they, 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 Joshua looked at him and says, guys, it's good. You've done well. You can go home and it must have been I bet a shouting time man gonna go home I can't believe home that's where the heart is now let's read on let's see what verse chapter uh, verse 10 begins to share with us as we begin to do that now remember we're to love God with all our heart mind soul and strength we're to do everything we can do uh, and give him all that we can now they came to the Jordan River these two and a half tribes came to on their way home. They had turned around from the west, and they began to make their way home. They began to make their way back. They, now we have a confrontation over their commitment that they had made. Verse 10 uh, says, And there came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, built an altar by, by Jordan, a great altar to see. As they were going home, they got to thinking about what happened on the west side over here. They got to thinking about the conquest that they had made. They got to thinking about the victories that happened, victory after victory after victory after victory. We've only read about one defeat they had, and that was at Ai, is because Achan took the accursed thing. Y'all remember that? Say amen. The only one loss. Everything was a win. And so as you had those wins, they began to think about it. And they said, we got to do something, guys. We, we need to do something. We need to, to make something uh, so that we'll remember this. We need to, to be, be sure to remember this. Well, uh, verse number uh, 10 says, they built an altar by the Jordan, a great altar to see. Uh, now that altar uh, was, was, was an awesome, was an amazed thing. It literally means to a great sight. It was a great sight. People looked at it, then they looked back at it, it was so big and so huge. It was a, 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 a perfect uh, uh, referral or perfect uh, 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 replica of the same altar that was in the Holy of Holies that the priest would come. They, but it was huge. It was, in 3D, it was gigantic. It was amazing. 
And they looked at it and they thought, that is awesome. We, we've done this. For, there's a reason we did this. And so let's read about it. Let's read some more. And the Bible said the children of Israel heard and say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar against the land of Canaan, the borders of Jordan, the past the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh, where the temple was at, to go up to war against them. Now that ticked them off. They thought they were trying to instigate something new, something different, something separate from what they had been taught their entire lives. They, were, they had assumed, everybody say that word, assume. They were assuming something that they really didn't know anything about. How many of y'all ever assumed something? Were you always right? Hmm. But yet we assume, do we not? Do we not assume things that probably many times we don't know the whole story? We assume things many times that we talk about, we run our mouths about, we talk about, we gossip about, and really and truly, you just assume. You're just assuming that's the way it is. That's what happened. The other nine and a half tribes heard that the two and a half tribes had built a great altar. They assumed that something was up. They assumed there was another reason behind that altar that they were going to instigate a new system. They were going to instigate something brand new and different. They, were going to inst they assumed those things, and that was their assumption. You see, the altar could be seen for a long, long way. Located in this very prominent place, we find it was done for a memorial to, to and for God's faithfulness through the years. The other nine and a half tribes saw it as rebellion. They assumed. They assumed. You see, sometimes, guys, assumptions get us in trouble. Read, if you will, continue to read with me in verse number uh, 13. And the children of Israel sent to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest. And remember, I told you Eleazar was Aaron's son, so Phinehas would have been a great-grandson. Phineas, and I, I shared this in the first service, we're going to call this the Phineas delegation because Phineas and ten members of the tribes all came together and they met them and they called the other two and a half tribes and they met them together and they were going to call them on the carpet. They were straightening them out. They wanted to see what they were doing because of this terrible, horrible thing. They had built an altar. How dare them? Well, and the Bible said, with the ten princes, verse 14, of the chief house of a prince throughout the, all the tribes of Israel, and each one at the head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Nassim, the land of Gilead. And they spoke to them, saying, and they said, the whole congregation of the Lord, what trespass is this you've committed against the Lord, the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord in that you have builded you an altar and that you might rebel this day against the Lord? They just said, why have you done this? This is outright rebellion against God. Why would you do such? They assume. Everybody say that word. Assume. Say it again. Assume. They assume something. They didn't know the facts. And they were ready to go to war because they had assumed they knew what was right. How many of us know in the good old Baptist church, we all have good old Baptist fights? Come on, raise your hand. Say amen. We do, don't we? We don't always agree on things, and that's okay. I, I think it's healthy to not, to not always agree. I think it's healthy to, to, to sometimes begin to think about it. I think there's a place for that disagreement to be settled, and I believe it's at the altar. Come on, say amen. I think there's a place for that. So the thing about it is, is when we begin to think about it, they assume these things. Well, let's listen to what happened. Verse 17, they reminded them of Peor. And he said, the iniquity of Peor too little for us. He said, from which you are not cleansed until the day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord. You know what happened at Peor? Numbers 25 tells us that in Numbers 24, the children of Israel, 
Israel married the beautiful Moabite women. God had told them to stay away from the beautiful Moabite women because when you marry the beautiful Moabite women, those Moabite women, they worship idols. And what happened is you're going to worship idols if you visit with them, if you have sexual relations with them, you're going to be a part of them, you're going to have relations with them, you're going to live that away. And God said, don't do that. And guess what? They did it anyway. And when they did, God went in and he had to wipe them out. There's a real interesting story about that. This same Phineas, this same Phineas took a javelin and run it through the heart of a man and a woman who were having relations. Very interesting story. He took care of that. And thousands of people were killed because of their rebellion, total outright rebellion against God. He said, don't you remember that? Oh, my stars. Phineas was telling him, he said, I was there. I lived that. I want you to remember that. Don't miss that. Verse, uh, verse 18 says, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord. And it be seeing that you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow you will be brought and the whole congregation. But you brought this horrible curse on us. And these guys, the two and a half tribes, are sitting over here looking at each other thinking, that's not what we did this for. That's not what we did this for. We didn't do that. Read on. Verse 19. Notwithstanding in the land of your possession, be unclean. Then pass you over the land of possession of the Lord. He said, wherein the Lord tabernacle dwelleth and take possession among us, but rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in the building of the altar. He said, beside the altar of the Lord our God. He said, listen, here's what we need to do. You guys leave the east side and come on the right side. Y'all leave over here. He said, don't live over there. Come over here and live with us. We'll make room for you. He assumed. Assumptions are just like, I guess, a dollar now. You can take a dollar and go buy yourself a big drink at McDonald's, okay? Everybody wants to do that. Everybody wants to assume you know what's best. I know what's best. We know what's best. Folks, one of the things that I have found out is if it's not bathed in prayer, it's probably not worth doing. Come on, say amen. Don't assume. Follow me here. And then he goes on to say in verse 20, Nor did Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on the whole congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. He said, look, do you remember Achan? You lived that. Oh, why did you build this altar? Why did you alter what God said to do? Here comes the answer in verse 22, verse 21. The children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, said to the heads of the thousands of Israel, the what I call the Phineas delegation. Y'all remember the Warren Commission, don't you? And after John F. Kennedy passed away and the Warren Commission was the, was the group set aside to study what happened to JFK. Well, this is the same thing that happened. We just call it the Phineas delegation, okay? Phineas was going through this, and so they begin now to give an answer. Verse 22. The Lord God of gods. The Lord God of gods. El Elohim Yahweh. They wanted them to know, first and foremost, that they didn't serve any other God than El Elohim Yahweh. They wanted them to understand this was very serious to them. And Israel shall know. And he knoweth, God knows that. And Israel shall know that. That if it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. If we've done that with ill will in our heart, kill us now. Kill us now. Don't let us live another day. If that was really why we did that. Verse 23. That we have built an altar, uh, us an altar to turn the following of the Lord. Or if there uh, thereof to burnt offering or meat offering. Or if any other peace offerings therein. But the Lord himself require it. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing. Saying in time to come are your children. Might speak to our children saying. What have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? Wow. Now the truth comes out. We didn't do it to turn people away we did it so that our children and their children and their children and the future generations would know that we serve a God that's bigger than anything we can ever imagine come on say amen church our God can that's who we serve we serve that God we serve El Elohim Yahweh 
serve the God of God. We serve the God that no one can compare to. We're not serving someone else. We're not breaking off from the tribe of Israel. We're Israelites indeed. We love God. We want you to know that we love God. And we care about what this is said. And sir, if this be wrong, then kill us today. They assumed. You know, many people every day we see, we assume something. We assume everybody's going to heaven, don't we? Huh? Don't we assume that? It, we assume that many people just think, well, they're just all right. They're pretty good people. But folks, we don't know where they're going to spend eternity. You know what I've heard so many times right here in this church? I wonder if they were saved, Brother Kim. I wonder if they were born again, Brother Kim you know do you know what they, if they were Christian or not do you know and we assume oh what are we gonna do folks you see we can't assume anything when it comes to someone's salvation don't assume be concerned enough to say hey man if you were to die today do you know for certain you'd go to heaven to be with Jesus because Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe isn't that right amen Jesus did that for us too much assuming in our world today. Too much assuming that you know what's really the truth behind someone's desire to serve God. You don't know that until you ask them, until you talk to them. Don't assume. I believe assuming an assumption is a sin. I think they assumed right here. And I don't think God wanted them to assume. The Phineas delegation called them on the carpet. They told the answer. They gave their answer. They began to share with us. And he says in verse 24, But if we have not rather done for this fear of this thing, saying, In time to come our children, verse 25, The Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, and the children of Reuben and the children of Gad have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, Let us now prepare to build an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness. Say that word church witness you have a witness in our community you have a witness with your life you have a witness to share that's our job is a witness when you die what kind of witness will your life have given one for Christ, or one everybody's scratching their heads saying, I wonder where they went. A witness. A witness. If there's anything the 21st century church needs today is not to be squabbling with each other, but to be not to be squandering the time that God gives us, but to be sharing the gospel with the lost and dying world. Say amen, church. My stars. Look at there. Look at verse number 27 again. But that that may be a witness between us and you and our generations to us that we might do the service of our Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings that your children may not come, may not say to our children in time to come, you have no part of the Lord. See, what he was saying was the Western kids were going to look at the Eastern kids, all the same uh, bunch of Israelites, and they were going to say, you don't know our God. And the Eastern kids were like, well, you don't know our God because there's a separation here and there's an altar here and you're doing something different than what we're doing. No, folks. There is one God and we need to serve the one true living God. Say amen. One God. He's one. He's true. He's the living God. And we need to make sure that we're giving a witness for that. Don't assume the truth. You'll know the truth and the truth of what? Absolutely. Get the truth. Get the facts. Don't assume. Therefore, verse 28, we said, 
it shall be that we should say unto us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, Behold, the pattern or the likeness of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, not for a burnt offering or for sacrifice, but it is a, there it is, witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt sacrifice, for meat offering, for the sacrifice beside the altar of the Lord that our God is before us today. Folks, there's only one way to get to heaven and that's through Jesus amen they're not implying there's another way they're saying this is for a witness so that our kids when they come to the Jordan River and they know that this man of God stood there holding the Ark of the Covenant they parted they went on the other side that the one true God is the one who allowed us to go over come on say amen You see, folks, when they look back on these last 8 to 10 years of service to the Lord and all the battles that they fought and all the difficulties that they'd had, all those trials they had, they had to say they were getting to go home, home. The Phineas delegation had assumed, verse 30. And when Phineas the priest and the princes of the congregation and the heads of the thousands of Israel which were with them heard the words of the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh, it pleased them. You ought to underline that. It pleased them. They were grateful for what they said. You see, guys, we say things, we do things we should not do all the time. We assume we draw hasty conclusions. We get fired up. We get ready to rumble. We get ready to settle to score to, to, to settle the score. We we think that we're on the right side, but but folks, we do not have all the info. We need to be like James, swift to hear, slow to speak. They were pleased. Verse thirty one. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, to the half to the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive the Lord is among us. They were unified because you have not committed the trespass against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and the princes returned from the children of Reuben and from the children of Gad to the land of the, to the land of Gilead, to the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and all brought with them word again. All is well. And the thing pleased the children of Israel. And the children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them in battle to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and the children of Gad dwell. They finally got their facts. They finally got the truth. They finally realized they did this. They had a reason. They had intent. They had a purpose. And their heart was not to pull apart, but their, par- their desire was to pull us together. Now, one of the most unusual passages of Scripture I found is the next verse. I want you to look at verse 34. In verse 34, the Scripture says this, And the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, called the altar, what? Say it. Say it again. Altar of Ed. Ed, the altar. Think about that. Have you ever heard that before in your whole life? I read that and I thought, I just giggled. The altar of Ed. The word Ed means witness. Everybody say that. It means what? Witness. Over and over we've read that. Witness, 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 witness. The altar of Ed was a witness. He said, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is who? There's only one. The altar of Ed. There it was, huge. I mean, it was a sight to see. It was incredibly big. The nine and a half tribes on the west side thought that the two and a half tribes over here was going to break away, was trying to do something to mess everything up because they knew that Shiloh was the place that they could only offer sacrifices to one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And they thought something's up, they're going to do it. See, they would even did it on the, op- on the west side of the river so it wouldn't be convenient for them to go there and offer a sacrifice. They did it. They put a separation between them and the Ed. They did it so when their kids would come to the edge of the Jordan, that old muddy Jordan River, and say, boys and girls, I want you to see this. You know, we're getting ready to, to go out on the jungle safari or off the map. The boys and girls are going to be this week. We want to be sure to let our boys and girls know that there's only one way to get to heaven. Say amen. We want our boys and girls in this generation or the next generation to know that the, heaven is a place that everybody needs to go, but everybody's not going to get there because of their choices. You're not going to go your way. 
there's only one way Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the Father except by me and we need to be a witness for the Lord God Almighty our hope our desire our, desi our, our longing in our heart do not act do not act in haste nor knowing the motives not knowing someone's desire and their real motive in their heart, but rest in the fact God does not never desire us to assume that we know everything. Nobody in here knows that. Many people assume you know. If I started a bit of, of juicy information right here at Bobby, by the time it got back up here to Cole, uh, to Cole on the front row, Bless God, it'd be the most horrible, perverted mess by the time everybody got through whispering that in their ear. By the time it got done over here, it would be horrible. You know that. It'd get juicier and juicier about who's having an affair with who, and we'd all like that, wouldn't we? Because you see, the junk seems to go a long way. Never assume you know until you know the facts. Say amen. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. So help you God this morning we're coming to the very end of this amazing story of the children of Israel we're coming to the very end of a long long journey of years and years of a journey you know I know a lot of people today that are struggling at the altar they're afraid to come here they're concerned about being here they're worried about what everybody else is going to think when they come here. You know, I've learned a long time ago, I really don't care what somebody else thinks when I'm trying to get a hold of God. Can I have an amen? It really don't matter to me. I worry today in the church, a lot of churches don't even have an altar call anymore. A lot of churches don't offer the opportunity for for them to come and, and, and come to the altar and get a hold of the Lord and, and encourage you to do that. I know you get tired of me begging you to come. This is a place that we need to be because it will alter us. The altar is a place of sacrifice. The altar is a place of surrender. The altar is a place of sure death. That's what happens at the altar. That's why we need the Lord is to come and alter our lives before Him today. If I assumed everyone, even you, every one of you in here today was going to heaven, man, that'd be a blessing. That'd be a joy, wouldn't it? I, I just love that everybody would go to heaven. I love, but I don't know your heart. You do. And I'm not going to assume that. Here's what I will assume that all of us are sinners because that's a fact. That all of us need Jesus because that's a fact. That all of us today need the Lord Jesus today. That's a fact. You can't do this on your own. Come to Jesus today. Would you bow your head and close your eyes?